I'll keep Johnny. going. I'll keep up. Ah, they, there we go. Oh, I think it's woo. better. All right. Uh, <laughs> that, that also tends to happen right about when you give up things, things start to work. <laughs> so, um, I, I feel at home already. So they say, I, I am Naomi Cedar. I'm, I'm currently the chair of the Python Software Foundation Board. Uh, and um, I, will, I want to talk a little bit about um, some things, you know, I, Nico said starting out that community was very important to him and I feel completely the same way. It, it's uh, really, really a very vital thing. Um, we have this mythology that coders are solitary and locked away just doing their code late at night with no one around. And probably we've all kind of gone off somewhere to code by ourselves, but even though solitary coders need uh, context and need um, people to, to, you know, to appreciate their software, we all want to have what we do known and recognized uh, in a community. It, it's a very essential part of, of human nature. Oh my, well, it's doing odd. Th oh, there we go. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm always mindful of what Brett Cannon said. And I have, I have stolen this line and used it so much that in fact, Brett has said, no, look, you've got permission. You go, go ahead, keep using it. Uh, but you know, in the 2014 PyCon, uh, he introduced that with the phrase, I came for the language, I stayed for the community. And um, this is the one thing I think about when I think of Python. And when people ask me how it is Python went from this little unknown language, um, my first contact with Python was in 2001. We're at a conference of 12,000 people. They wondered if there would be enough Python people to make it worthwhile to go out and have a beer. So to where we are now, which is um, second most popular language, third, I mean, it kind of depends upon where you look at it, but this, this phenomenal growth uh, that we've had in the community I think it all comes down to just this, uh, that uh, it's um, the power of community. So, you know, since um, community is, is kind of a, um, something that, you know, in, in Amsterdam you're working on, and, you know, I, uh, we actually had the PSF board meetings in November in Amsterdam, so I know I stopped by uh, a pie ladies, uh, and met people there, and that was a lot of fun. And um, you know, it's there, there's a lot of good stuff going on there. Uh, but you know, I wanted to to share a little bit in terms of of practical tips for. Um, I think I think you're one ahead of me, or am I one ahead of you? Let me see. Community. Um, one moment, please, while we sort this out. No, nope, I, I got ahead of you. My I'm, my fault. So let's let's go on one more slide. Sorry, um, and um, so when you're building community, there are some aspects that you want to think about. One of them, of course, is culture, and I think this is one that that we think about a lot. Uh, and that is, you certainly want to be sure that you have a safe, inclusive, welcoming environment. If you're building a community, you want more people to come, not fewer. So in order to make sure that you get as many people as possible and from, from different backgrounds, you need to have uh, a safe and inclusive and welcoming culture. And that means, I'm afraid, that you need a code of conduct and you need to have ways to enforce it. So um, having a code of conduct is great, but it shouldn't just be this kind of uh, rubber stamp thing that you copy and paste from someplace else. Uh, it should be something that you've thought about how you're going to enforce because having a code of conduct is great for building trust with, with people who are going to come into your community. If you don't honor that trust and make sure the code of conduct has some sort of force, then you will lose that trust and you will never get those people back. So 
uh, you know, clearly you want to think about things like that, ways that you can include people that you might not otherwise. And I think that's one of the benefits of coming together in a community anyway, is that you can, can take advantage of different people with, with different ideas, different backgrounds, uh, and things like that. So now, next on to the practical side. Um, I've been starting community events for not quite 20 years. Um, and there are, are really a couple of things that you really should probably do to make sure that your uh, meetup continues to grow. Uh, and one of those things, as you're looking at building, uh, building out things, is having some sort of regularity. People should be able to predict when you're going to have a meetup. If they always have to be checking Twitter, if they always have to be checking Meetup, those are great tools and they will do a lot, but there still will be some people who just go, huh, it's Wednesday. I think we'll have a Meetup, I'll go check. And then they'll see that yes, you do. And then they will attend. Uh, so, so you might wanna keep that in mind. Uh, and then the other thing, as I say, is making it easy to find and, um, you know, this is kind of with mixed emotions that I say, oh, you should use Meetup because I, I don't really like to give that kind of endorsement to just one company. But if you're trying to have a Meetup in the tech space, meetup.com is kind of the way to go because they seem to be everywhere and reach everyone. Uh, and um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but the PSF has a policy of supporting meetup.com fees for Meetups so that if you're afraid you, you would have to pay something, um, by all means, contact us and, and we might be able to help you cover that so that you don't have to do that yourself. So just a couple of things though, it should be predictable, it should be easy to find. Um, and you know, the vast majority of meetups I've seen manage to do that um, pretty well these days. Okay. Uh, the last thing I want to say about um, on the, the sort of building community side sort of involves outreach. And um, these are, some of them are obvious, maybe some of them aren't. Uh, one thing, of course, is to use multiple channels, social media, personal contacts, you know, depending upon your, your environment. Um, if, for example, you're in, say, a university environment, then there are all sorts of bulletin boards where you can put up little flyers and that works. Uh, if you're in more a, a business type environment, that doesn't work. But the point is you want to use all of the tools you've got to get your, your uh, uh, information out there. Um, the next two, these are the ones that I think maybe people don't appreciate fully. Um, personal contact. If you can actually talk to people to get them interested, I know there it's, it's, it seems impossible to talk to all the people that you need to talk to uh, to, get, to get the word out. But um, if you make that attempt, that really is a powerful thing. Uh, I, have given, um, I have given talks because people have contacted me and said, hey, we would really like you to consider putting in a proposal for a talk. I have attended things because people have said, yes, it, it really would be, um, would be great if you would do this. Um, when I was, was starting up um, our Transcode Hack Days in London, uh, starting in 2014, it felt for a while like I was going out for coffee or a drink with every person who might be invest, invested in, interested in my event in all of London. I mean, it just seemed to go on forever, but in fact, that led to us having a successful event. So don't, don't neglect that. Uh, and related to this, I've got um, here on the slide, encourage a network of asks. And what I mean by this is something that I learned from watching uh, Jessica McKellar as she helped us build out um, diversity in PyCon US. And that is, if you take that personal approach and you talk to somebody, email somebody, whatever, to ask them, would you be interested in this thing we're doing? 
the follow-up question, this is the thing people always forget, the follow-up question when they say, oh, no, I'm not really interested, is always to say, but would you know of somebody else who would be interested in, can you put us in touch with them? Can you pass our information along? If you do that, you will actually multiply the effect of, of your personal asks and you will build interest. So for any of you out there anywhere that are trying to build community, and I think you know, in the situation that we're in now, it's going to be even harder. I would suggest maybe you think about some of these things. And, and certainly if you have other ideas or other questions, you know, feel free to, to contact me. I, I'm happy to talk about those things. But that's sort of, in, in any case, I am really am delighted that, that all of you are, are building the community in, in Amsterdam. And I, I look forward to the next time I'm back to see more events going on. I, I, I promise I will try to stop by to one. Um, okay, last thing I can tell you is sort of what I was, was talking about here. The PSF will do what we can to support um, community building. Uh, you have heard that we have a, a grant program for, uh, that's not so much for, for meetups, but for small conferences, regional conferences, and so on. Uh, and as I say, we support um, meetup.com fees. Uh, at the moment, as I'll, I'll talk to you later, the grants part of that, having a grant for a conference to support a conference or something like that, is temporarily on hold because we've got a lot of things that we need to understand before we can start uh, giving out grants. But I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, but in any case, if you have any questions about any of these things, uh, of course, you're, you're totally welcome to, to contact me. Uh, my email address is at the, the end of all of these slides. Uh, but you can always get in touch with the PSF by just emailing psf at python.org. Okay, it's kind of all, all business that, if that concerns the PSF, if you don't know where it goes, it goes here and one of the staff or one of the board members will, will help you out with that. So, so please you know, be happy to that. Yeah, we can move on. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit more about the PSF and the global community and, and, and how that, that interacts. So um, as I say, um, we have supported communities around the world uh, quite a bit over the past few years. So in 2019, we gave out roughly $325,000 to events around the world. Uh, that was more or less evenly split between North America, Europe, uh, South America, and Africa. Um, not, there is some support in Asia, but that is just growing. Um, we have uh, started in 2019, we started having more contact with uh, Chinese Python communities. There are, I think, seven PyCons in China. Uh, they, they have their, their whole series of things set up there and, and we're now starting to deal with them. So uh, probably Asia will be, be more represented. Uh, and to do all of the things that the PSF does. So PSF, part of our mission is supporting the community. And that's what I was just talking about. Uh, part of our mission is to protect the intellectual property of Python. So we do a lot of things involving uh, trademarks around the world. Uh, we're working to get um, Python, PyCon, PyLadies trademarks around the world. So to support all of that, we have now the equivalent of five and a half full-time employees. So we have a, uh, in addition to what we give out, we have a sizable commitment in terms of salaries, insurance, and things like that, that we need to cover to keep our employees doing all of these things. Uh, helping organize PyCons, helping be fiscal sponsors, helping do other things. So that, that gives you a background of the things that we're doing which kind of sets the scene for what I want to talk about next. 
Yeah, next slide, thanks. Um, so to finance that, what the PSF has always done uh, has relied on profits from PyCon. We get a lot of sponsors into PyCon that, that give us our profits. We don't make any profit on the attendees. I mean, if you've compared prices, uh, PyCon US prices are pretty low for, for you know, all of the things that happen there. And in fact, PyCon, if we were just doing it with attendees, we would probably be able to do only half as much. Uh, because it, you know, we don't cover our costs through uh, registration, but through sponsorship, we make our profits and the profits we make there uh, usually provide about 65% of the money that the PSF takes in for a year. So it used to be higher than that. We have been working to uh, diversify, get sponsorship in other ways and, and reduce that. But it is a huge, huge chunk of what makes the PSF able to function. So basically the profits from PyCon cover all of those expenses I mentioned in terms of paying lawyers to secure rights and uh, insurance, uh, insurance for our employees, but also insurance for events that we, we you know, were connected with. Uh, all of those things and staff salaries, staff benefits, all of that uh, comes out of that. Uh, okay, next, yeah. Wah -wah. Uh oh. Ah, there we go. Uh, so um, now comes COVID-19. Um, and as you know, PyCon was canceled due to what the lawyers call force majeure, uh, meaning basically there was no way we could hold a PyCon. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a second. Uh, and we have spent um, the past two weeks in various negotiations with the venue and hotels and all of that to, to kind of uh, take that out, um, basically close down PyCon in an orderly way. And this has been something that, um, you know, when we were at the beginning of February, I honestly thought that we might be able to have PyCon and the COVID-19 would hit the States maybe in May or June. Uh, by the end of February, I was thinking, oh, we're in trouble. We, this is not gonna work. And then by um, the middle of March, uh, it, it was pretty inevitable, but it's taken us until now to, to get all of it sorted through with, with all of the agreements. So I, as I say, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, we can go on. Um, so yeah, why did it take so long? Uh, if you were watching Twitter, there were all sorts of people who had helpful opinions about what we should be doing. And most of those people didn't know all of the things that we had to do, I'm afraid. Um, so we needed to wait until we could invoke this force majeure. In other words, until legally it was not really possible to have PyCon uh, in order to cancel. And to do that, we had to wait for the government of the city of Pittsburgh and the state of Pennsylvania in the US to declare uh, basically to force the closure of the event, to force cancellation of mass events. Um, otherwise, if we would have, as soon as we sort of saw, oh, this is gonna be bad, if we would have just pulled out, we would have probably had uh, double our loss. We probably would have lost definitely over a half a million dollars in uh, penalties and obligations that we had by contract to those events. So I know a lot of people were saying, well, why don't they just cancel it? Well, believe me, um, it, was not, it was not a responsible option because if that money goes away, then it will be even longer before, excuse me, it'll be even longer before we're able to start supporting the community the way we have. So we were really trying to, to protect those resources so that we could use them in the community. 
So, so that's sort of the, the, the bad news and a little bit of the behind the scenes there. Um, we were really waiting for all of that legal stuff uh, to happen. Uh, next slide, please. So with force majeure in effect, <clears throat> basically we still will give everyone who uh, has registered uh, a refund. We will give them the option to not accept that refund, but we will give everybody who, who needs it a refund. Uh, people who are getting financial aid, sometimes they had to uh, do things that they might not be able to get a refund for. Uh, they had to pay a fee to get a visa. Uh, maybe they had to book their flight in advance and the way they booked the flight, they can't get anything back. Uh, we're going to cover all of those expenses for people so that they will not lose money by trying to come to PyCon. Um, we will refund sponsorships. Again, we have a lot of people who are, uh, a lot of companies that are saying, no, we're going to let you keep the sponsorship because we want to support the Python community. But if they want a refund, we will give them a refund less a, a portion to cover the expenses that we had before the conference even started that were just part of things so that we could even do sponsorships. So uh, we'll do that. And all of that means that basically for 2020, uh, PyCon US as the main money maker for the PSF will come in pretty much at zero. Depends. If we get a lot, more, a lot of sponsors leaving their sponsorship money, we'll be better off. But right now, we're 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 planning on the assumption that if we have to give everything back, we break even. So you know, you might might wonder a little bit about what, where does that leave the PSF? I outlined all of the things that we do, and you know, we've got a big budget. Well, um, some of us who've been in the Python community for a long time will remember in 2008 and 2009 we had a similar crash, and PyCon was a big disaster and nearly, nearly financially wiped out the PSF. Uh, some of us who have long memories uh, and are on the board um, have been worried about that. So in fact, the PSF has built up a reserve of funds for just this kind of thing. And again, some people have sort of said to us, well, you know, why don't you just spend that money on the community now? What could possibly go wrong? Well, this, it turns out, is what could possibly go wrong. So um, we, have, we have enough money to keep operating for another year and then some. We had about a year and a half in reserves. So uh, we are able to sort of take this as, okay, we didn't make any money. Maybe we'll get some sponsorship, but we're, we're able to keep going um, as, as before. Um, I think maybe you could go on to the next slide. Ah, there we go. But there are some things that, that we are not sure about right now because we don't know where we're at. So since about last week, we've put on hold any of the grants that the PSF gives out for events. We don't know when we will be able to give grants again. We don't know if we will be able to give the same amount again. Uh, a lot of this depends upon the support that we get from, from sponsors and things like that. But for right now, until we know, for the next few weeks, we we put that on hold. Uh, we're going to look at ways that that we can um, that we can raise extra money. Uh, you may see various things come from the PSF in the name of fundraising that you haven't seen before. That's that's what these things will be. And. Um, we have, uh, we are going to uh, offer the option to everybody who is either a sponsor or registered for PyCon uh, to just make their, their registration or sponsorship a donation. So if a person registered and they decide, no, I'm okay, I don't need that money back, it's gone, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's fine, uh, they will have that option to make that a donation. Uh, if sponsors want to, um, maybe use the money that they have paid us already for some other kind of sponsorship deal, we will work with that. Or if they just want to leave it with us and say, fine, here, do this to support the community, 
those those are all um, those are all options that we will have. Um, the other thing that we'll do, which is actually going to be some sort of ex will be a, a, at least some expense, but we don't know how much, will be that um, we do want to do something online for PyCon 2020. Uh, I can't speak to that right now because the staff is still really trying to work out what it might be. Uh, I don't think it will be as interactive as this. I think a large part of it will be the option for accepted talks to uh, be recorded and then maybe we'll release a bunch of them on the YouTube channel uh, and uh, at, you know, once a week or something, you can get a fresh batch of PyCon talks. Um, there may be some other options for tutorials. Um, we had a bunch of hatchery events. Uh, the hatchery was the thing I was uh, you know, organizing uh, an opportunity for different types of events. So we had uh, several summits, we had hackathons, we had various things going on. We'll, we'll be in touch with them to see what they might be able to do online, but we don't know. So all of those are things that, that we're looking at and uh, we, we hope to be able to, to share with people uh, going forward. Uh, and I think, let's see one more. Uh, as I say, on online uh, content. Um, so you can follow the PSF at Twitter. Uh, on Twitter, you can uh, subscribe to the PSF community mailing list. Uh, if you go to psf.org and uh, become a member of the PSF free basic member, you're automatically added to that list. Uh, if for some reason you're not there or it's gone to your spam, you can look at that. that that's going to be another area where we will announce that. If you were registered for PyCon, you will get direct mail, uh, the option to, to opt into getting direct uh, email notifications for what we're doing for PyCon. So I guess all of that. Um, I think we can go on to the next slide. Um, all of that means that, you know, if you can afford to support us, we certainly appreciate that. And if your community can support us, we certainly appreciate that. But we are heading into um, some, some tough times ahead. Uh, second here. Uh, we're heading into some tough, tough times ahead. So if that does not work for you, that is totally fine. Um, we, we certainly don't want to put a strain on people where maybe the, their financial situation is really going to be impacted by uh, the current situation. So, you know, above all, I think the message from the PSF is stay safe, take care of yourself, take care of your loved ones. We will have in-person events again. I refuse to believe that we will not have in-person events again. I, I love them and I miss them so much. Um, but for now, I think yeah, yeah, what we have to do is what we have to do uh, online events like this and, and keep moving forward. Um, so I think that's about all I've got for you. But you know, if anybody has any questions that they want to uh, enter into the channel or anything like that, um, I'd, I'd be happy to take a shot at answering. I don't know how much time is left because I tend to run on and not pay attention to time, but. Um, uh, it, it, we are we're okay with the time. And uh, if, um, I think we, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can just write it in the chat or you can raise your hand and I can enable the audio for that person. So anyone? I do have a question, so I can, have, I can give time for someone else to think. Sure. Uh, do, do you know what the PCF is going to do with the grants that are already, so I can imagine that there is a lot of different events that are going to be canceled. For I was organizing one. So we right. were, we, with some friends in the, um, in the Python Spain community, we were organizing right. an event. And then we, we have a grant. I think we are, I don't, I'm not sure, but probably we already have the money because, and that grant was for, uh, we, we, we need to discuss how, how to manage that. But I can imagine that's going to be the same for a lot of, of different right. events. So. so, I mean, I think the first thing that we did was we, for all of those events that were in progress, we, you know, contacted them to see if they were going to do it um, online, move online or not have it in person because of the obvious, obvious um, risks there. 
Um, I think that, you know, there are some that weren't decided because we do have a, a fairly big uh, queue of, of things that we're working on. And then, as you say, there are going to be some that have been paid and um, aren't going to happen. My sense is we will have to deal with those one-on-one -on -one individually and see what the circumstances are. Um, if it looks like the event is never going to happen, we would certainly love to have our money back, but we're not going to go hunt people down or ban them for life or anything if they just can't do that. Um, if you know, there's, there's some way where the, it looks possible that that money might be put to a reasonable use in some, some time frame. Maybe that's what will happen. I mean, I, I, I can't speak exactly because it's going to depend on, on all of the circumstances around that. But anybody in that situation should go ahead and, and contact um, basically the PSF mm -hmm. at python.org and, and, and let us know and we'll work with you. Okay, so I don't know if you're seeing the chat. There's uh, a question there is, who, who can I help the Python Software Foundation to raise money is one question. Well, I mean, so there are, I guess it's up to your creativity in a way. Uh, I think one thing that um, I, we've done a little bit of in the past, we will have a, a funding and membership drive is to, um, occasionally people have offered to match a certain amount like you know i'll match a hundred dollars if somebody else puts in a hundred dollars that's it's it's usually very powerful if you know, like they look and say okay this person is going to put up some money i guess i can uh is very powerful any kind of fundraisers that you might want to do i guess uh but i think probably the thing that would have the most impact if you're in the situation to um where you're using Python professionally and it is a key tool in your company. Uh, as it's the case with a lot of open source software, a large number a part of a business runs on free software and they don't pay anything for it. Uh, and I know in our company, we, we will pay somebody like Microsoft a bucket of money for, for some product. And then side by side be using something that was you know, developed by a handful of open source developers that is more valuable and they get nothing. So if we can get sponsorship and it doesn't even have to be huge sponsorship, we'll talk to you and, and see what there is. Um, but even a few thousand dollars from a company that's maybe paying tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for non open source software as well, that, that that's probably where the most impact will come. Uh, Okay, let's see. Good resources on learning how to enforce code of conduct. Um, the uh, person, I don't have the link right off the top of my head, but um, the person that the PSF has been working with this a lot on is uh, Sage Sharp. Uh, and they have a company devoted to, uh, to this uh, that is called Otter Tech. That, that is, thank you, Florian, that is exactly the one. Um, so that might be a good place to start. Um, and um, I think off the top of my head, that's maybe where I would start. You can look at things like the more recent um, PyCon code of conduct and PSF codes of conduct, which are available on GitHub, as well as being available on the, on the respective websites for uh, things that they do, because both of those have uh, a fairly lengthy list of steps involved in reporting and steps involved in responding. So those also might be a place to start. Okay. So, oh. any other questions? Well, let me just read off of there and plug people to go and put in a lightning talk at the link that's that's showing in the <laughs> chat. Yeah, we have a, we have a few already. So cool. still space. Okay. Well. Hey, again, thank you very much. So much. Uh, we 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 need to clap like. <laughs> <laughs> at least I can see people. That's good. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> My pleasure.
Yeah, thank you, thank you. That was really nice. Um, yeah, it was a uh, people clapping there in the in the chat. Yeah, there it's you a go. feature. It's a yeah, feature request it. for. Now. I see it now. <laughs> it's a feature request for Zoom. Huh? We, you need like a button to. Yeah, yeah, we need a clapping button. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, for. Uh,